Hello and welcome. Uh, it's been a very, very tough few months. The number of COVID-19 cases is now over 400,000 a day, close to 4,000 deaths. That's, of course, if you believe the official numbers, which are mostly uh, not uh, likely to be anywhere near what the case is, particularly in some parts of the country. Now, fighting COVID uh, it comprises many, many aspects. One is the, the, the treatment. Uh, if you do contract it, the ideal situation is, of course, you prevent it and you never get it. But if you can't, then you get treated, uh, depending on who you speak to, anywhere between 85 and 90 percent of people do get treated and recover quite well or reasonably well. Uh, there is the 10 percent who uh, may get uh, hospitalized or, uh, or, or things may uh, worsen a little bit from there. Uh, our understanding of the disease has obviously improved since wave one. Remember that we are in wave two now preparing for wave three. But the, the larger question is, as individuals, how do we better prepare ourselves for an environment where we constantly have to check whether we indeed have uh, the virus and at what points do we check? How do we check? How do we know whether uh, the test that we uh, go for is giving us the right result? So these are very, very important questions. As we go into a more active testing phase, as most of us will, as we uh, travel, as we get around, uh, knowing how to test ourselves, what to test and how to test and who to test with as well is going to be a very, very critical thing. So to, uh, to understand all of this and uh, uh, also understand equally uh, the role of vaccination, which is the only cure, by the way, is not a cure for the virus, but it is the only preventive cure that we know of at this point of time. Uh, and, and how do you vaccinate yourself? Uh, a lot of you who are in the 18 to 40 to 4 uh, uh, age group who are, who are non-frontline workers, because frontline workers had that opportunity earlier already, uh, are now getting a chance to vaccinate yourself. Uh, the others, that is between 45 and 60 and 60 and above, were already there uh, either from April 1st or even before that. So uh, how do you vaccinate yourself? What happens when you vaccinate yourself? What are the things that you should be looking out for? What should you be concerned with, not concerned with? When should you take the vaccine? So all of these questions uh, deserve to be put to someone who can answer them with credibility and authority. And I'm pleased to be joined uh, by uh, Dr. Arjun Dang. He's the chief executive officer of the well-known Dr. Dang's laboratory in New Delhi. Uh, my name is Govind Raj Atiraj. I'm the founder of India Spend. We are a data journalism initiative. We use data to tell stories. We also run something called factchecker.in, uh, where we fact check statements made by people in public life. And our larger mission is to improve the quality of public discourse, which fits in quite well uh, with the conversation I'm about to start. So Dr. Dank uh, is based in New Delhi, and uh, so he are his lab laboratories. He completed his MBBS and MD in pathology from Sri Ramachandra Medical College in Chennai, post which he did a clinical fellowship in liver pathology from the King's College Hospital London. He's worked as a senior resident in the Department of Specialized Hematology in Lady Argent uh, Medical College and as a research fellow in the Department of Histopathology in Indraprastha Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. He's helped up he helped set up one of India's first drive-through centers for sample collection for COVID-19 patients. And uh, his laboratory has been selected as a central laboratory for central safety testing of Covaxin. Uh, that's uh, the India's first indigenous COVID-19 uh, vaccine produced by Bharat Biotech, for which the entire testing in phase one and two was performed at the central lab. So on that note, uh, it's a pleasure to interact with you, Dr. Dang, and let me hand it over to you, a presentation to all of you who are watching, and thank you for joining in on this hot summer afternoon. Uh, you, uh, after Dr. Pre uh, Dang's presentation, we obviously go into a QA, and a but I do hope to receive all your questions and throw them at Dr. Dang, and I'm sure get answers to your satisfaction. On that note, it's over to you, Dr. Dang. Thank you so much, Govind. It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be interacting with everyone today. And the need of the R to understand exactly which test to get when you actually suspect COVID-19 and the many myths around vaccination, the vaccination drive that is going on from a scientific perspective, I'll be more than happy to take through uh, everyone regarding these things. Also, I would like everyone to take home a few messages that after the presentation, if tomorrow, if you're in a discussion or a short uh, dinner or a Zoom meeting, you can tell your friends and family that, okay, this is what you should do. So clarity is something that I'll be aiming at. And the Q&A also after the session can obviously help clear any doubts that people have. So we can start the presentation now. So uh, before starting and setting the context for the presentation, I'll start with the apex body globally that concerns all the medical issues and the health concerns of the world, that is WHO. 
Now, WHO, before calling this pandemic a pandemic, actually called it an infodemic. Now, the reason for calling it an infodemic was because there was just so much. There was hordes of information available all over the internet, news channels, social media handles. So it's obviously an, a pandemic that is further being accentuated because of this false information that's circulating. Now, it's very important for us to understand which are the correct facts and put those to action also. Also, WHO, after calling it an infodemic, soon had a guideline that released with the headline of test, test, and test. Now, why testing is so important? What is the use of this testing? And how to actually go about this testing tomorrow if you, if you have any symptoms or are suspected? I'll take it up in the next few slides. So moving on to understand testing, first we look at when. Now, there are three questions that you must ask yourself whenever you think to get tested or a family member or a staff member or a colleague. When should you test? What is the exact date or the timing of testing? Because that is crucial for an accurate diagnosis. Then after this, you have which. So by which I mean is that which test should you go for? Now, there are several of these tests available out there with different labs. People will be telling you A, B, C, X, Y, Z, which test to actually opt for. But the correct test at the correct time is the absolute solution to reaching a diagnosis. And then after that is the very obvious what. So when you get a report, obviously the big disclaimer is that you must consult your physician. But obviously in these times when COVID-19 has overstretched all healthcare facilities with a dearth of doctors, I feel it is incredibly important right now, at least to understand the basics of what the report means and then action things accordingly around you. So first we'll start with the when. So before actually going on to very crisp answers to when should you test for, this is a graph to understand how the disease or the infection evolves. Now, I've tried to keep it very simple here. If you look at the x-axis with me, that's the horizontal line at the bottom, the gray colored line. Now, day zero is the day when you have any kind of exposure. So that means that probably you met someone who had the infection or it was, it was through contact with uh, 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 someone who, who was coughing or was unwell. So that is day zero. That is the first day of exposure. And then from this day, till the day when you develop your first symptom is called the window period. So window period, not just for COVID-19, for any infection or any, any kind of disease, there is a window period that is basically the time from exposure to when you get your first symptom. So uh, this is the window period. After that, uh, you see the light green line that starts on day seven and then the orange line that starts on day 14. So now these three lines that you see here on the graph, the blue line basically indicates the presence of the RNA. So basically, like all of us humans have DNA, this particular virus has RNA in it. So the RNA that needs to be detected starts from day zero, slowly climbs up, peaks at about one to two weeks, and then again starts dropping like you see in this particular graph, and it reaches zero again by almost four weeks. The green line that you see, that is the IgM antibody, starts at day seven, peaks at day 14, and then again declines to day 21. Again, after this, the third one, you have the orange line on the graph. This is the IgG antibody that only starts developing on the second, second to the third week and then stays elevated for a few weeks to a few months. Now, in a nutshell, for you to understand, depending on which stage of the infection you are at, you have to go for that particular test. So just remember that it's first the RNA, that is the antigen that needs to be detected. If you miss out from detection during that time, then go for the IgM antibody that's only there in the second week of the infection. And then after that, if you want to know if you've had COVID-19 in the past, not as a diagnosis, but just as a surveillance to know if you've been affected in the past, then it's the IgG antibody. On the next slide, we'll be talking about when exactly who should test. Now, just keep that graph in mind that I just explained. Now, there are broadly three categories that I'd like to put people into. One is the symptomatic ones. 
Now, now symptomatic ones mean that you have the usual symptoms of COVID-19, you have a fever, you have a cough, you have any flu-like illnesses, then you can certainly test on the day one or the day two of the infection. So that means that you have symptoms, you should not panic, but certainly try looking for ways where you can get a test done. Obviously, which test to get done, how to get it done, we'll discuss it subsequently. But symptomatics, S for symptomatic, S for soon. So as soon as you get symptoms, get tested. After that, you have a huge category of people which are asymptomatic. By asymptomatic, I mean that, okay, you met someone and had close contact with someone, and now you've heard that they've tested positive. This is the time when you should be very careful. The worst thing you can do at this stage is as soon as you hear, and probably you had met them day before or yesterday for dinner or something like that, you immediately rush in for a test. That is absolutely not advisable because at this stage, like I explained to you, the window period of the infection itself is about five days. This window period can be as less as two days till up till two weeks and at an average of five to six days. So by an average, I mean that a majority of these infections uh, can be detected within five to six days of the illness. So if you're asymptomatic and have just had exposure, then certainly sit tight, monitor your symptoms. If you get a symptom, you test as soon as possible. But if asymptomatic, please, please do not rush and do not panic to get a test done wait for at least five to seven days post-exposure. Now, the third category that we have is post-infection. So suppose you've had the COVID-19 infection, you've recovered very well, you're completely asymptomatic, and now you want to test again to see that are you still positive? The current guideline that's actually come out yesterday only by ICMR clearly states that there is absolutely no requirement for anyone to test after 14 to 17 days of the quarantine period. So what that basically means is that once you diagnose that you are diagnosed positive on an RT-PCR test on day one, after that, if you quarantine for two weeks, the virus itself is inactivated. That means you stop shedding the virus. And if you've recovered well, and that is the case with the majority of the people, you do not need a repeat RT-PCR test. Obviously, it's difficult because the peace of mind that people get after a negative on the report is unparalleled. But in these cases, when there is so much of a surge of the infection, so much of demand for testing, obviously, it makes some sense to actually cut down on the, the burden on the labs by at least people who've recovered and can easily break quarantine to get a test done. Now, apart from this, I get a very frequent query. Uh, from a lot of people and also people watching and viewing this can understand is that, okay, so if your driver or your, or your cook or your house help is probably joining back to work, then what do you do? So a lot of people have reached out to me with this query that dog, our driver or our house help has come back from the village or had gone somewhere, has come back and we want to get them tested so that they can enter our kitchen and enter our houses. Now, again, you have to treat them like the asymptomatic category. Obviously, if they have symptoms, you go for tests as soon as possible. But when a person comes back or a house help comes back, you have to quarantine them for a minimum of, like I said, five to seven days before actually going for a test. Because what happens in a lot of these cases is that people rush for a test. And then obviously, the RT-PCR test that they do comes out negative. But again, don't forget, this is the window period of the infection. So even a negative can turn a positive in two or three days. The person can start coughing in two or three days. And then it will be disastrous if that person has already entered your house and then the probability of transmitting the infection to the family members, etc. So keep in mind, asymptomatic people returning to work cannot test immediately. They need to be quarantined for a minimum of five to seven days. Apart from this, also you have a lot of requirements for testing, especially for travel. So for international travel, domestic travel, a lot of airlines, airport authorities, state governments are asking for a COVID test. So in, in most of these cases, especially in international cases, what they ask for is a RT-PCR test. And usually when do they ask for it is within 48 to, to 72 hours of the flight time. So it's very important to understand that in any kind of travel-related requests, 
when do you test you test in 48 to 72 hours for domestic travel it is either the rt pcr or the cb nat test now moving on to which test to actually do so uh, it's very simple for diagnosis that is when you want to see if the person has current infection the gold standard and the big boss the test the main test that you need is the rt pcr test so rt pcr stands for real time polymerase chain reaction but for you to understand this is the test for diagnosis globally considered as the gold standard now the rt pcr is obviously a cumbersome technique wherein a large number of samples are run together that's why the tests take multiple many hours usually rt pcr tests for example in our lab take up to 12 to 24 hours but this remains the gold standard and unfortunately even the gold standard today has a sensitivity of about 70% so that means that yes there are few cases that are missed on the rt pcr but primarily because of two or three major reasons again one of the main reasons is that people test too early so like what i was telling you in the previous slide if you test before the symptoms start or before the level of the virus is that much that the rt pcr can actually detect it you might get a negative that might turn into a positive in a few days so certainly it is very very important to time your test well and that is only in your hands not in the healthcare practitioner's hand so make sure you time your test properly the second one also why a lot of time rt pcrs give a negative is also uh, because the sample is not collected properly so the sample that needs to be collected for an rt pcr test is a nasopharyngeal and a oropharyngeal swab so the nasopharynx is basically the area behind your nose and that's why when the swab goes in it should touch the back part and it should be twirled for a few times in both nostrils and then also at the back of your throat so make sure when you're giving a sample this the swab goes deep enough so that the virus can actually be detected from there so after the rt pcr recently that has been launched in india is a fascinating test according to me this is the actual game changer where a cbnat test is based on rt pcr technology as accurate probably more sensitive because it is run for more cycles and the best part about it is about, about it is that although the rt pcr takes up to 12 to 24 hours sometimes more the cbnat test gives you the result within a few hours so inside the machine it would take about 1 to 2 hours so we have a capacity of churning out about 12 tests every 40 minutes when it's inside the machine so again cbnat gives you faster results as accurate probably more sensitive but certainly at a higher cost compared to the rt pcr so a lot of times cbnat requests comes from come from hospitals where patients are critical and the report is needed in a couple of two or three hours so certainly it has to be used very judiciously but adds to the repertoire of testing for covid-19 in a very effective way for critical cases so apart from this the third test on the list which i want to talk about is the rapid antigen test so uh, the rapid antigen test basically is a very quick test so in a lot of these government cab camps in a lot of these hospital setups you you will be hearing that okay i got my swab test done and i got the result within a few minutes so whenever you hear that you have to be sure that it's a rapid antigen test so like the name suggests rapid and antigen so antigen is again the first week of illness that graph that i that i explained to you it detects the antigen in a very rapid way so it does give you results very fast within a few minutes but then again keep in mind that anything that's quick won't be as accurate as the other tests so the rapid antigen test although it has advantages also but it certainly misses out on a lot of cases so it has a very high false negative result so i'll discuss that on the next slide but apart from this the other tests for covid-19 that we will be discussing today are again the antibody test now this antibody test has had a lot of publicity a lot of media has also covered it and i'm just going to break it up very simply for you so the top three tests that you see here in the list the rt pcr the cbnat and the rapid antigen all are for diagnosis so when you want to find out if a person has a current infection then go for either of these tests 
but if you want to know that has the person had an infection in the past that is not for diagnosis but only for surveillance then you go for an antibody test now again referring to the graph that i started with it's the igm that's the igm antibody that is developed during the second week of infection that is from day 7 then the igg that develops after 2 to 3 weeks and stays up for about a few weeks or a few months and total antibody that is basically igm igg and the other antibodies put together now out of these three antibodies igg antibody is the one that can show a very good correlation with anyone who's had a past infection 2 to 3 weeks after the infection has finished so for example if you were a diagnosed positive on day 1 then on day 14 to 21 or even after 21 21 to 28 if you check your igg levels and if it's positive then yes there is a high probability that you had the infection and now you've recovered also the igg uh, gives a lot of information about the humoral response of the vaccine that you've taken i'll be discussing this on the next slide apart from this the final test related to covid-19 infections is inflammatory markers again you would have heard a lot of people who are covid positive the doc asks them to do some blood tests now these blood tests basically are advised only in people who have persistent symptoms or have a, a critical stage where certain medication needs to be started on the basis of these tests now i'd like to make it very clear that not everyone who has covid 19 needs these blood tests now obviously these have to be very judici judiciously selected also that is the patient base needs to be selected very carefully because there are only a small percentage of the number of people who actually are critical and whose oxygen is dropping that needs these tests these tests like crp c reactive protein d dimer ferritin interleukin 6 all together tell you what is the level of inflammation in the body which are the medicines do you, do, do you need to start on steroids do you need any kind of other medication that will get the inflammation down and and exactly what the doctor supposed to do should you get admit, admitted into a hospital so all these questions are answered on the basis of these blood tests only but more important than these blood tests is actually to monitor the clinical uh, condition of the patient uh, uh, so you measure the oxygen levels you see how the symptoms are measure the uh, fever also and then only if your doctor suggests go for these tests along with these inflammatory markers also a lot of time people rush in for a ct scan again a ct scan that has high levels of radiation is certainly not required for everyone ct scan and also these blood tests are not for diagnosis of covid-19 yes they can be understood as prognosis of covid-19 but only for people who have persistent symptoms ct in cases of when people have excessive cough so basically which test to do the top 3 for diagnosis then antibody for surveillance and inflammatory markers to understand the disease progression so after this we come to the next slide that basically tells you okay so you've gotten a test done at the right time hopefully and also the correct test that i've just explained to you and you get the report then what do you do of that report what how do you interpret that report so again with a lot of rt pcr tests there's a lot of talk about ct values and what they actually indicate should they be given in the report and and is your doctor interpreting it correctly and actually what it means so basically for all of us to understand like in us humans we have dna in the virus it carries rna now this rna in the swab that is taken from your nose and your throat what we are trying to do inside the lab is to detect this particular rna that resembles the virus now there are certain genes that the virus possesses that we target in our entire detection system and if we find that gene then we tell you that you are positive now basically there are two kind of genes in any any of these rt pcr tests so one is a screening gene and one is a confirmatory gene this these screening genes and genes and confirmatory genes can vary depending on lab and which test you you have used but when we are actually searching for these genes we carry out the entire process in cycles so we have cycle 1 and then cycle 2 cycle 3 
and then we cycle the sample up till cycle number 35 so anyone who has a gene that is detected before cycle 35 that is cycle 1 to 35 is called as positive and suppose someone shows a gene that's coming up or is amplified after the 35th cycle we call them as negative now it's very important to understand that these cycles that we are doing one two three four five when you are detecting that particular gene it is given a ct value of that particular cycle so for example if we are testing someone's sample and we find that the screening gene is in the fifth cycle and the confirmatory gene comes in the seventh cycle then your ct value will be 5 comma 7 Suppose the same happens, say, in 12th cycle and 15th cycle, then your CT value will be 12, 15. If it happens on the 24th and the 26th, it will be 24, 26, and so on and so forth. So basically, for you to understand, the faster we detect the actual gene or the faster we detect the RNA, the CT value will be lower because we're detecting it faster. So the faster you detect it, lower is the CT value, and high, higher is the viral load. Again, very important to understand that the CT value is not an accurate indication at all about the viral load. But yes, on a very broad perspective, it helps the doctor understand that is the patient with a heavy viral load and is actually transmitting the virus to the people around him? Or is it towards the fag end of the infection and he's hardly transmitting the virus? So basically, a lot of doctors say, although it's not a fixed value, but any value below 24 means that there is a significant volume of the viral load and the patient is infecting the people around them. Whereas if the value is more than 24, it means that the person is not transmitting the infection. But again, the CT value again can vary between machine to machine, between lab to lab, and even on the quality of the sample taken. So never read too much into the CT value. And obviously, consult your doctor what needs to be done once you get the report with the CT value. So again, very important to understand the rapid antigen test. That's the next point on this slide is that I was, I was talking about the RAT test, the super fast test that gives you results within a few minutes. So yes, this is a quick test. It is a cheap test. But then obviously, the disadvantage is that it has a lot of false negatives. So, so a false negatives basically means that it is a negative. Whenever you get a negative on the report, it might be false. So what that means is, suppose a rapid antigen test is giving you a positive result. So that certainly means that, yes, you will test positive on the RT-PCR also. But when the rapid antigen or the RAT test gives you a negative, it doesn't mean that you don't have COVID-19. It only means that you have to be more careful. And if symptoms are persisting, or the doc is suspicious, you should go in for an RT-PCR confirmation test. So be very careful while interpreting rapid antigen test results, especially if someone you know has gotten it and they say that, see my report, it's negative. Always exercise caution with a rapid antigen test. And if the person has symptoms or a high suspicion, definitely do an RT-PCR. So apart from this, again, interpreting antibody tests that we spoke about on this last slide as well. Again, a lot of people who've had infection and then they go for a blood sample. So basically an antibody is detected through your blood. And again, have a lot of questions about what does it actually mean? So antibody tests are primarily done in two conditions. So the first one is post-infection. So suppose you've had COVID-19, you've recovered well. So after two to three weeks of the infection, you can get an IgG antibody test done to see what was the immune response in your body against the virus. Now, these antibodies that are available with different labs always try to go for a test that has a very high concordance with a neutralizing antibody test. So neutralizing antibodies, like what neutralizing means, that it would neutralize the effect of the virus. So there are a lot of these antibody tests. You should always ask for the one with a high concordance with neutralizing antibodies or the IgG antibody directed against the spike protein. So these two tests are very effective to know what is your immune response to the vaccine or what your antibody response has been to the infection. Apart from this, also a lot of antibody testing is done before you donate plasma. So to say that a recovered patient 
has the correct amount and the correct type of antibodies before giving it to anyone who's who's undergoing the illness so be extremely careful while choosing antibody tests for yourself so we'll move on to the next slide yes so we are done with the testing bit and i'll be more than happy to take your questions after the vaccination bit so we can start with the vaccination myths that i have put together so yes this question that comes to me dozens of time every day is that um i go through these i've gone through these medical illnesses and i have this medical history Sh should i go for the vaccine and other kind of things because people are apprehensive about moving out also and also a lot of misconceptions about the vaccine that it does more harm than good but this question has a very simple answer and also it's very clear that the only answer to this question is yes in big bold capital letters you must take the vaccine and you should take it as soon as possible now the next myth that goes around is that okay which vaccine to take now there is covid shield there is covaxin there's also some news about the sputnik single dose vaccine that's come out which vaccine should you take which one is better so again a very simple answer all of these vaccines although you see different kind of data and different kind of figures with efficacy and you keep reading about side effects this and that but it's very straightforward every vaccine that that's out there in the market has a 90% efficacy against severe illness or hospitalization so our aim at this at this point in time where the cases in the past two weeks of covid-19 have been more than the uh, the cases were in the first six months of the pandemic is to go for any vaccine that is feasible and available at that time so remember all of these vaccines are similar but you need to get it as soon as possible whichever one is available to you so i have a lot of people asking me the doc we have these food allergies we have respiratory allergies we are on these medications so what are the contraindications so again there are only two or three contraindications to actually avoiding the vaccine so number one would be if you've had a first dose of this vaccine or you've had a vaccine before to which you had a severe allergic reaction then definitely avoid taking any kind of vaccination the second thing that that can be avoided in these cases that should avoid in these cases is people below the age of 18 that is children and also pregnant women although a lot of healthcare workers who are pregnant have taken the vaccine and there haven't been any kind of side effects i would still say let's wait for some more data before actually vaccinating children and pregnant women so again it should be avoided in these two categories as well apart from that a lot of people ask me that yes we are on blood thinners should we go for the vaccine we, we've had various food allergies should we go for the vaccine certainly yes and uh, with blood thinners there is a certain segment of blood thinners where the doc might want to check how thin your blood is or what your platelet count is so again a small segment of blood thinners you can ask your doctor for advice but any other kind of food allergies that you have or respiratory allergies that you have is not a contraindication to not taking the vaccine so certainly go for the vaccine in case you have had an allergic reaction to a prior dose or a prior vaccine yes again a lot of people who have already been infected in wave 1 and now in wave 2 they have this very pertinent question that should we get vaccinated because we've had infection we've recovered also we have a robust antibody response so should we get vaccinated again so the answer to this is very simple is that yes you must get a vaccine about 3 months after recovery now the indian guidelines sometimes also advise you to get vaccinated between 6 to 12 weeks post recovery but the latest guideline by cdc also says that extend this time period to 3 months now the reason for that is that after your infection your body is anyway mounted a very good immune response now the whole point of the vaccine is to further boost this immune response but your body needs to peak at the antibody post the infection so give it some time give it 2 to 3 months recover completely let your antibodies peak and then go for the vaccine shot that actually adds as a booster to the existing immunity that you have also another contraindication that i missed out on in the previous point 
was that if you have any kind of flu like illness or fever or any kind of critical illness then you can certainly avoid the vaccine but certainly if you've been infected with covid-19 and you've recovered completely and it's been about 2 to 3 months then certainly you can go for any of the vaccinations available coming on to the very common myth is that okay i i have my vaccine so i can go party now i can i can lower my guard down and i obviously won't get reinfected so that kind of complacency i would attribute to this second wave that we are having in delhi also right now because after a large number of uh, our people got vaccinated i think they had the, this false sense of security that creeped in and they really lowered their guard down so certainly it is absolutely false that this vaccine will prevent reinfection or infection by covid-19 there have been hundreds of people and a lot of healthcare professionals also who have been reinfected and infected for the first time after getting both doses of the vaccine after about 2 to 3 weeks of the second dose also and also having had a very high level of antibodies they've still gotten infected so then the question would be then why get vaccinated what's the real use so like i told you these vaccines have a 90% efficacy against severe illness or hospitalization so you can go for these vaccines because no one wants to end up with a critical illness or a severe illness where your oxygen is dropping and and you need serious medication and you need hospitalization so these vaccines don't prevent illness so you can't let your guard down so your mask hand hygiene social distancing all the protocols have to be in place but certainly it would avoid you to reaching a stage where you have to get serious medical attention so again the next myth that i am going to discuss is that a lot of people are asking that okay there are different kind of variants for the covid-19 virus now there's a uk variant south african brazilian and so on and so forth so which vaccine to take that will protect me against these variants now obviously there's a lot of talk also about this double mutation multiple mutations so i'll just take a minute to explain to you what are these mutations and what are these variants so with any kind of virus the best example actually is the flu virus so these viruses are very very uh, smart organisms and they actually adapt themselves to evade the human response so that they can be more lethal to the human so as the covid-19 has spread globally in all the countries the organism that's the virus itself has gotten smarter it's found ways wherein it can ev evade the immune response that a person has built up by the previous infection or a previous vaccination and still infect the person so this ever evolving biology of the organism or the virus itself needs to be combated with constant r&d and research from the vaccine manufacturer side and that's why you will also notice that these vaccines like the flu vaccines will need to be taken at 6 monthly or 12 monthly intervals to prevent a uh, widespread transmission of the infection so again all these vaccines are effective against these variants against these double mutations and triple mutation viruses that we are seeing now and they are effective because they prevent any critical illness so yes vaccines will protect you against these variants also okay so this is actually a question that comes to me and people are really uh, really tensed and worried and are panicking that doc we got our vaccine or we we had an infection and it's been 3 weeks and 4 weeks and 5 weeks and we've checked it multiple times that we don't have any antibodies is something wrong with us is there something wrong with our immunity so certainly if you have no antibodies post your vaccine firstly you should wait till 2 to 3 weeks after your second dose but even after 2 to 3 weeks of your second dose if you still don't have any antibodies the number one rule is never panic because this is not something to panic or worry about what's important to understand is that any vaccine will mount two kind of responses in the human body the first one is the antibody response that is the humoral response that we are checking with the igg antibodies and the neutralizing antibodies and the second one is the cell mediated response now every i've already explained about this antibody response but the cell mediated response is basically the t cells in your blood so these are certain kind of white blood cells 
that get activated once you take the vaccine. And these play a very, very important role in actually protecting the person against the virus. So currently, if you're checking your antibody response and it's sluggish or it's very less, then it's, it's not a reason to worry because you would have mounted a T-cell response also. Unfortunately, at this time, there is no commercially available test to monitor and track these T-cell responses. But we are hopeful that within this month, we should, mostly all labs in India, should have this test that measures the T-cell response that will give abundant clarity about the status of the human's response against the vaccine. So again, the next myth is, uh, myth is recommended gap between doses. A lot of people have been also asking me that uh, they know a person who had gone for vaccination and got infected just after two or three days. And is it because they did something wrong? Is it because your immunity is lowered post a vaccine? What is the actual reason? So again, the myth that post vaccination, your immunity drops for a few days and that's why you get a fever is completely false. So the reason that you get a fever is because the vaccine's working. The vaccine is actually instigating your uh, body to make an immune response because of which you might get a slight fever for a few days or a few hours, but it's nothing to worry about. It's actually good you're getting a fever right after your vaccine. A lot of people have also tested positive for RT-PCR post-vaccination. That is not because of the vaccine at all. That is basically because of two reasons. The first one is that immediately after your vaccine, you don't have protection against the infection at all because the vaccine takes a few weeks to kick in. And certainly at this unprotected stage, you've gone and had exposure in a healthcare facility, waited in observation for about half an hour, had exposure with other people. And that is the reason because of increased exposure while vaccination during this tremendous surge that we have in the city, that you might have gotten exposed and might have developed a positive uh, viral infection that is a positive COVID RT-PCR. So certainly nothing related to the vaccine. Again, the rec recommended gap between doses, that's very simple. Co-vaccine is currently at four weeks, whereas Covishield is at six to eight weeks. So you must keep that in mind before going for either of these vaccines. And I hope that I've managed to give everyone some kind of clarity about which test to get, when to get it, how to interpret it, and also that a vaccine, taking a vaccine is a must, and there is absolutely nothing that should be keeping you away from actually going out there and getting a vaccine. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tang. So is there a place where I can find this, like a flow chart or a chart where, you know, I can look at some of these things and then maybe put it up on my refrigerator and then refer to it? Because this so is very comprehensive, but 90% of which is almost impossible to remember. Great. So I can I can obviously provide a small flowchart, like a one pager, like a take home for everyone in a nutshell that they need to remember. So that's a great idea. We can circulate it, post this, anyone who requires it. Okay. So I think you've answered most of the questions uh, that people wanted to ask. But before I pick up on a couple, and we've only got about 15 minutes now, uh, tell us how it works. I mean, you know, when, when someone comes to you, uh, you as in your laboratories, and they give a swab or even before that, how do the how does that swap get collected? What really happens? If you can show us to the extent that you can show us, maybe it'll help people sure. remove some of that mystery. Sure. So I'm sure all of you, mostly all of you, would have gotten an RT PCR or probably will have to in the future. So actually, it's it's really simple. Uh, these are two swabs that are taken. So this is the swab that is taken from your nose. So this is a thinner swab. Again, it, it, this swab is supposed to go till the back of your nose and then twirl. So it's very important that the thin swab is used for a nasopharyngeal specimen and also a thicker swab that's used for an oropharyngeal that is at the back of your throat from inside your mouth. So once you take both these swabs, that is the technician or the medical professional, medical staff who's taking, once you collect both these swabs, they put it into this this fluid or this different colored fluid in a plastic tube that's called a VTM. So this VTM is basically a viral transport media that preserves the virus so that we can test that effectively in the lab. Again, it's very important. One thing that you can do while giving these swabs that will increase accuracy of the test is check your name on the VTM before giving the sample. So a lot of labs actually put a barcode here with your name printed on it. But if that's not the case, make sure the labeling is correct. 
because the majority of these cases wherein a person tests positive and is actually not positive is not a mistake inside the lab it's a pre analytical error so it's a labeling labeling er error and that's why make sure that you request the person like can i see the name on the vial and check your labeling because a lot of people talk about false positive that i wasn't positive and that lab gave me a false positive it's not a false positive it's actually that the labeling was wrong and it was probably someone else's sample that got mixed up with yours so always be sure of this also another thing that i can show you is that when i was explaining to you rt pcr versus cbnat so this is basically the 96 well plate that is used inside a cycler when 96 person samples go in at the same time now this is the rt pcr test the time taking cumbersome test because 96 tests are being run at one time versus the cbnat test that that is again like a cartridge based test and this can run one test in about a few about 40 minutes and uh, that's why this cartridge requires very less trained manpower gives you much quicker results as accurate also and that and the reason for that is because you can run one test at one time instead of running 96 okay so uh, i think there are questions and and let me sum them up uh, about the the quality of the tests or the veracity of the test right so what you're saying is that uh, and and i was talking to uh, dr velumani of thyrocare a few days ago and he too said that he was uh, uh, pretty sure about the uh, the rt pcr test because it's a nobel prize winning uh, 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 methodology and uh, uh, approach so so i think two questions i think one is that uh, why is it that maybe the errors are increasing because we clearly didn't see as many errors in the first uh, in the first wave secondly uh, is could the could also the role of uh, or could there be a role of this new mutant or uh, like the b1617 or some other muta uh, mutant or mutation which is affecting the results of uh, these rt pcr tests sure so so like i explained in my presentation rt pcr remains to be the gold standard that the world has currently but it only has a sensitivity of up to 70% so so that basically means is that there are three reasons because of which an rt pcr can be negative when it's actually positive the first one again and in your hands is the timing of the test so if you test too early and the viral viral load is less than the threshold then obviously you will get a negative when it's actually a positive the second one is the sampling again if you don't have trained manpower or trained professionals doing it you might not get the correct nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swab and that obviously affects the test also the third one again being that with such uh, increasing capacity all over the country and various there are hundreds and thousands of labs doing the test you have to be very very discerning about which test you which test kit you actually use and also the manpower that goes into running these tests so the volumes and the capacity like the government has also said that all labs should increase capacity but i am a firm believer that yes increase capacity but calibrate it with the quality and the report time also because it's easy to increase capacity but to maintain quality and that report time is more important in these times of the pandemic right and and so you're saying there is no impact of the mutation or the new mutations which are clearly causing so, more so there are a lot of cases govin where the rt pcr is negative or repeat rt pcr is negative but you get very very uh, uh, very good signs on the ct to say that it's covid 19 so certainly there might be some variants that are being missed by the rt pcr but there are also a certain set of kits so the testing kits also matter so you need to be updated with the guidelines and the mutations and pick the right correct kind of kit also so uh, no so is that something for you to do or for me to do uh, me to for ask for the lab to do that's that's for the lab okay. professionals to do is to pick the right kit and, and the lab professionals today are doing that yes, or at least most, most lab yes that's that's what we aim to do okay got it so uh, a couple of questions on expecting mothers are they eligible to get the the vaccine and uh, if not as ishupal sehdeva asks when and how do we safeguard expecting mothers Yes. So uh, currently, all the trials that were done for all these vaccines were not on children and on pregnant women. 
So there is no data that says that yes, it is safe for pregnant women. But yes, along this time when the healthcare workers have been vaccinated, there have been a lot of people who've been expecting, a lot of ladies who've been expecting who've taken the vaccine. So what I would actually suggest right now is that for pregnant and lactating women to avoid taking the vaccine, at least till we have more data that is confirmed. Right. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of questions on that. So uh, the other question which also comes uh, is that can I, what if I take uh, one vaccine, Covishield, and then maybe Covishield is not available, which is happening now, and I start panicking and I say, should I take Covaxin if it's available? Sure. So, so basically how these vaccines work is that they have their effect for up to few months. Now, these few months can be from three months to six months. So by annually, anyway, you will need to get another vaccine. So there is absolutely no harm in changing vaccine. For example, if I got Covishield in January this year and then in July, August later this year, I go for Covaxin. There is absolutely no harm in that. Okay. So, uh, you know, many of us travel or used to travel and uh, at some point we would want to travel again. So we had this very interesting situation uh, where two members of a Indian government delegation who landed in the UK landed positive. So this was headline news in the United Kingdom for whatever reason. So now the question is, could those people have maybe not tested at the right time? Because, you know, when you travel, you don't know whether you have symptoms or not symptoms, you know. Uh, so how do you calibrate that? And, and so as to ensure that you're actually not carrying it into another country, because the test may well be negative, but you might be carrying it and it may turn positive when you land there. That's right. Again, again, Govin, very, very uh, pertinent and relevant question. But we can only strive to get the best diagnosis at the time of landing. Now, that can be done with two, two techniques. The first one is that you quarantine the individual. Like even when you uh, looked at the earlier months, government was very particular about actually home quarantining the person and they got a stamp, etc. and they were monitored. So you're quarantining the person along with the testing at the time of landing. I think that's the most effective way. But obviously travel, this has happened so many times that, uh, that a person has flown and was negative then and then has further uh, turned into a positive when they land. So this can certainly be mitigated if you test at the time of landing and at the time of takeoff and plus quarantine them once you land. Okay. So, uh, you know, clearly, uh, again, and anecdotally and uh, as well, uh, a lot of younger people are contracting COVID and are also seeing far more severe impact than they did in wave one. Now, is there anything that your stage, which is testing, which is reflecting all of this and the way the virus is progressing in the second wave? Yes, so certainly it's it's actually unfortunate, but we've seen a lot of people in the younger age group not only get the infection, but also get a severe infection. Now, it's very unfortunate that this is happening in the second wave. It's probably because of the double mutant or the new mutants that are coming up, because any kind of mutant would vary in two factors. One is transmission or spread, and the second one is severity. Now, obviously, the severity is more in the younger age group, and it's also spreading faster. So the younger age group are getting affected, not to forget that it was also the younger age group that wasn't vaccinated. So that certainly plays a role in making them more prone to getting infected again. But the good part again, Govind, is that there is a, a lot of a lot of these intranasal vaccines that are coming up and those will be effective against children also. So keeping our fingers crossed so that we can uh, vaccinate them soon. Right. Uh, Kamlesh Ganwani asks, what happens when two RT-PCR tests done on the same day have different results? What does that indicate? So that's very simple. You believe the positive one. So like I told you, from a scientific perspective, the false negatives are known in an RT-PCR test that the viral threshold is low or maybe the sample is not taken properly. So you'll get a negative on the test. But to get a positive on an RT-PCR test is scientifically not heard of. It can be a labeling error, like I explained to you, but a positive versus a negative, you believe the positive. Okay, uh, someone asked if one has antibodies with a value of 90s after three months of having had fever, uh, not tested for COVID, does it mean I had COVID? And what values of antibodies in what range of time are indicative of a good immune response? Great, great. Again, very relevant question. I get this very often. So again, uh, so if you've gotten the IgG antibody tested or the neutralizing antibody tested, and if you're talking about a titer, again, the unit matters. So if you're talking about AU, that's AU per ml, and it's 90, then I would say it's a decent response. That would mean, yes, you have been exposed to the virus. 
maybe a few weeks or a few months back and yes it is a decent response but no stretch of imagination it means that don't get a vaccine then also with a value of 90 you must get a vaccine okay uh, anuj kumar says uh, my father suffered brain hemorrhage in 2011 and is paralyzed on the right side half body since then he is bedridden so his question is uh, do you see any problem in vaccination uh, considering his present situation so again this comes into the expertise of the physician because i'm sure he would be on certain kind of medication and blood thinners also so how these blood thinners actually work i can tell you in detail also but i don't think it will be time worthy is that there are a certain segment of these blood thinners like vitamin k antagonists and of and warfarin and a few others wherein the doc needs to check something that we call as a pt inr so that tells you how your blood is clotting and if that is uh, as per the expectation of the doctor then you can certainly go so you can ask your doctor if you need to run any coagulation tests or clotting tests and if they come up to normal or within a specific range then there's no issue with a vaccine okay so uh, dr anna sharma a couple of on a point and a question and we go very quickly i she says i think cdc and uk say it's okay for breastfeeding women to get vaccinated uh the next question uh, from the same person should you avoid getting pregnant after the vaccine and if so for how long okay so i'll uh, answer the second one first so if you've gotten a shot of the vaccine and after that you discover that you're pregnant there's absolutely nothing to worry about we are only erring on the side of caution when we say that okay pregnant women should avoid the vaccine the first question that you asked me was that yes there are guidelines with cdc saying that uh, lactating women or breastfeeding women can take the vaccine but obviously these are again times when it's a young virus we are still learning about it so certainly within certain guidelines it does say that you take the vaccine but i would still say that if you can just be isolated quarantine and avoid it for this, these few more months then there's absolutely nothing like it. right okay so uh, we're running out of time uh, dr dang so uh, let me ask you a slightly broader question right now uh, you've seen this for a year when i say this i mean the intensity of uh, the attack of this virus now uh, what what would you tell people you know the the problem with anxiety is that you also want to keep getting tested uh, you know you want to you want to now that you've given us four or five different types of tests it is tempting to now say okay what is my antibody level i've got vaccinated should i test again it can be very tempting and uh, and maybe that can also have sort of uh, a, a negative uh, outcome uh, particularly from your uh, perception point of view so how do you recommend people live their lives you know i mean how often should they visit you i know it's good for your business if they do but nevertheless how often should they actually think of visiting you uh, when should they uh, actually be thinking of uh, taking tests and which tests and otherwise really sit tight and do everything else that they're supposed to do to stay safe certainly so so very important to understand this and govin it's actually not about business in these times because we are flooded with requests if you are symptomatic if you have any flu like illnesses then go go for the test immediately or at least quarantine immediately even if you are in the younger age group to protect your family members and the elderly around you you can certainly quarantine yourself and if the symptoms persist go for a test if you are asymptomatic and you've had exposure there's absolutely no indication of testing but you can wait out 5 to 7 days quarantine yourself and then if you get any symptoms do the test so again let's let's try to be very careful about how much testing we want to do from a patient's point of view because obviously we need to save these tests for the people actually who need them more right and and that's a, that's a very important and good point to end on particularly at a time like this uh, dr dang it's been a pleasure talking to you thank you for giving us all your insights uh, we'll look forward to uh, uh, a snapshot or a flow chart uh, uh, somewhere maybe on social media where where you could share uh, and how people could you know understand and then apply that to their lives